Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Uh, my name is Max Smythe. I'm a software engineer. I work at Google. And I'm Rita Jay. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. And today, we'd like to talk to you about OPA Gatekeeper. So for anyone here who isn't familiar with OPA, uh, what OPA stands for is Open Policy Agent. And it is a general purpose policy engine. It's open source. It's a CNCF incubator level project. And it is what Gatekeeper is based on. And Gatekeeper is a customizable Kubernetes emission control uh, webhook that helps you enforce policies and strengthen governance of your Kubernetes cluster. So we help you to put guardrails around your applications. So you may be operating tons of Kubernetes clusters in your organization. You might be wondering, are there ways that I can help control what end users can actually do on the cluster? Are there ways that can help me ensure the cluster is actually in conformance with all the company policies that I have? Um, and some of these policies may be there for regular, re regulatory requirements, or they just there might be there to help you enforce um, company best practices or whatnot. Um, but how do we actually do this, uh, ensuring compliance of the cluster while still not sacrificing agility and the flexibility and autonomy that Kubernetes bring to our end users. So these are some of the motivations that created the, uh, the Gatekeeper project. And to kind of give you an example of our thought process and how we feel it might be useful to people in the real world, we thought we'd walk you through a fictitious company and uh, sort of see what it could do for them. So without further ado, I present to you Agile Bank which is interested in building the greatest peer-to-peer -peer money transfer app ever seen. And uh, they work in a highly regulated industry. And unfortunately, at this bank, both the developers and the admins are not happy. Now, as an admin, I'm frustrated because I am the gatekeeper for all of the changes on our system. Right, so that means whenever a developer needs to, say, launch a new backend for a product, they need to go through me. And what that translates to is I am massively overworked. For instance, for this peer-to-peer -peer transfer app, uh, the developer has been looking to launch their dev backend for the front-end developers to test against for a few days now. Unfortunately, there's a lot of policies that need to be checked. They keep on changing, so it's hard for me to keep up. And I just have a backlog, so I feel I'm a, I'm a bottleneck. And it doesn't stop there, right? I'm not only responsible for affecting changes on our uh, changes on our backend. I'm responsible for making sure that what's currently running there is still compliant with policy. And that's tedious. As rules change, I need to comb through everything and make sure that it still is compliant. However, when I find something, there's no guarantee I know who owns that thing, right? So if I find an old namespace or an old pod, something like that, running with invalid attributes, oftentimes I need to go find the owner so I could check, is it okay that I fix this? And so, wasting a lot of time. Yeah, thanks, Admin. <laughs> and as a developer, I am constantly frustrated with the fact that I can't make changes to my application. Um, and currently, I'm trying to deploy a bunch of web, uh, back end web services so that the front end developer can actually integrate and launch our product. So I'm really frustrated, and I'm constantly having to contact this guy to make changes, and because I don't have the permission to make these changes on the cluster. Um, I thought that's something that Kubernetes is really good at. Um, so, and when my application requests get rejected, I have no idea what the reasons are why my deployment actually got rejected, and I just get a notice that says, you're not compliant to our policies and I don't know what to change. So the turnaround can take days, if not longer. So how do I make that can happier? <laughs> right, so we have two very angry groups. How can we make them happier? Uh, so there's some 
maybe some, some, some ways we could tweak this. The majority of the admin's time is spent enforcing policy. The developers are waiting on policy. It's kind of a black box to them. Uh, they know what they want, but they can't really get to it. If we can automate enforcement, we free up a lot of admin time, and uh, we can make sure that best practices are more uniformly enforced, and we could do things like make sure that all resources have a clear owner, so when violations are detected, we can more easily resolve them. Uh, as far as the developers are concerned, if enforcement is automatic, self-service is no longer as risky to compliance as it used to be. And if the error messages are instructive, developers don't need to be aware of the policies. They can sort of learn by failure fast iteration. Oops. Hi, Kitten. Um, and we talked about a lot of the companies have a lot of different policies that they already have. So for example, let's talk about some of the policies that Agile banks would really want to have. So as the admin mentioned earlier, one of the issues that Agile Bank has is not being able to identify the owners of these resources that are deployed in a cluster. So one policy that Agile Banks wants to deploy is ensure that all the namespaces have a label that actually identifies the owner of that namespace so that if there are issues, I have someone to contact. Next, we have another policy that really basically uh, allows the admin to feel a little bit more comfortable with the resource that are actually deployed in the cluster so, uh, so that there's actually resource limits so we don't run into issues where the applications run out of memory or are causing issues in the cluster. So one more policy that will be enforced is ensuring all pods will have upper bound resource limits when they're deployed. Next, we have another issue where uh, sometimes developers pull images from all over the place, as we all know. Um, so Agile Bytes really wants a policy that ensures that only the approved registries and images are actually deployable in the cluster. Last but not least, um, there are times where we deploy services that may point to different namespaces that could potentially be production. So we want to ensure that there is a policy that is in the cluster ensures that services have globally unique uh, selectors. Right. So when we look at these policies, uh, some, some common attributes come to mind, right? The first thing is that Kubernetes is declarative. So when we're talking about constraining the things people can do, really what we're talking about is constraining the ways they can express their intent in Kubernetes. So all of these policies are really just limitations on uh, valid fields for objects, right? So they're a series of constraints. And if we combine these constraints in an and-like fashion, meaning this must be true, and this must be true, and this other thing must be true, and if anything, uh, any of these aren't, then the whole request fails, then we can narrow and narrow the scope of valid inputs until we are left with only things that work for us. And this adds some nice extra properties like when I add a new constraint, the only thing I'm ever doing is further constraining the system. If I remove a constraint, I'm only ever loosening the system. And I don't need to worry about the actual effects in terms of like intersections because uh, it's only the thing that I'm modifying that will change, right? There's no, well, this, this one constraint affects this other constraint, and therefore now when I add this thing in, suddenly we get like a lot more permissive stuff, like you could get with, say, IP tables, and you add an allow rule uh, further up in the chain. Um, so, uh, another thing that's interesting here is that there's different styles of constraints, right? You have this allowed repository. You have the uh, labels, required labels. So there's different kinds of behaviors we're interested in for these objects. So that leads us to maybe we need different kinds. And further, we probably want to be able to configure these things Right, because what if we discover not only do we need an owner label in the future, we also need a security requirements, like a sensitivity label. Uh, it, it might be nice if that's a very quick change rather than rewriting everything from the ground up. So we probably need some kind of input schema. 
And we came up with what we call the constraint resource. This particular example is for the required labels. And you can see the kind is what is giving us the style of constraints. And then there are two pieces I want to point you to in the spec. The first is this yellow bit called the match. And the match essentially limits the scope of enforcement for a constraint. If I provided nothing here, this constraint would be scanned for all resources requested of Kubernetes. That's not what I wanted. What I wanted was to make sure namespaces have an owner label. So in this case, I uh, say I'm going to match against kinds. And specifically, I'm going to match against namespace kinds. And therefore, I'm constrained to namespaces. And the other interesting bit is in this red box here. This is the parameters field. And uh, you can see for labels, I have the owner key. So I'm requiring an owner label. And that label must follow this form. It must have A to Z, A to Z, dot Agile Bank, dot demo, which just happens to be the username format for Agile Bank. And also, I have a helpful error message for our users. If this constraint is violated, I tell them, you must have an owner label on your namespace. So we talked about enforcing the policies. Now, uh, with the audit functionality, we can actually um, look at how we can strengthen the governance uh, and ensuring the current state of the cluster is actually exactly what we want. So with the audit functionality, you can periodically evaluate the resources that are currently in the cluster against all the policies you've applied. And with this, it allows uh, admins to have an ongoing monitoring of the state of the cluster to basically have a way to detect and remediate all the previously uh, misconfigured resources. And the auto results are basically um, exposed via the status field of the constraint. So here's an example of a uh, constraint uh, that we showed earlier, um, and it basically ensures that the uh, namespace has an owner uh, a label. So as you can see, this, uh, the, the periodic audit actually gets uh, applied on the status field on this particular constraint CRD. And as you can see, each violated resource is then listed here um, so that a, an admin or, or, or another user can go and, and fix the issues. And the timestamp is basically a current snapshot of the violated resources in the cluster. All right. So we have two pieces of the puzzle, right? We have a way for our admin to express their intent in terms of their constraint. And we have a way to enforce that, either via the, the admission webhook or via audit. Uh, but we're still missing that critical piece of how do we actually write those constraints? How do we get the code into the system so it can be enforced? And there are two pieces to that puzzle. The first piece is the actual code, right? How are we doing these checks? And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we are built on top of OPA. And OPA's language is Rego. So uh, essentially, this means we need some way of injecting Rego source code into the system. The second piece of the puzzle is this parameterization of the constraints. How do we allow users to take this code and make it theirs, configure it so that it meets their specific needs. So that sounds like we need some sort of schema for input. And hopefully you can read this. It is a little small. Unfortunately, it's a very large CRD. Uh, but the idea is we came up with a constraint template, which packages these two things together. You could think of the top half uh, sort of from API version all the way down to targets as a skeleton for a proper Kubernetes CRD. And uh, you can see the under the CRD field here, we have the expected name of the CRD, in this case, Kate's required labels. And then under validation, we don't have the full schema for the CRD because a lot of that is taken care of by the system, right? particularly the match field. Uh, but we do have the schema for the parameters field. And as far as for requiring labels, in our example, we thought it might be useful to allow users to provide a list of the labels they're requiring, as well as some way to validate the expected value. 
So we have a list field to provide that, as well as a message field so that users can customize the message. And underneath that, we have the actual guts of the, uh, the constraints, which is the Rego source code. And you can see here the most important feature is that there, each rule, each constraint has a deny rule that is its entry point. And essentially what's happening is that for every validation request, this deny rule is called. And if it matches, then the constraint is considered violated and the message that is returned, this MSG field here, is uh, returned back to the user. All right, so that pretty much sums up what Gatekeeper can do for us. Uh, it, it provides an extensive, extendable emission system and it allows us to create policies via constraints and the constraint templates, as you've seen, it really, it's really powerful and it provides us uh, ability to write these as functions. Um, it is easily shareable, testable, and you can basically share these uh, functions um, internally or source it from the community, as we will do. Um, and uh, they're not just for Kubernetes, you can also use them in other systems, uh, maybe your own CI CD pipelines. Yeah. So let's see what this looks like for Agile Bank. First, we will return to the battle days before they had automated enforcement. So now I'm trying to create a namespace um, for my workload. Do, 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 do. <laughs> She's the developer. <laughs> oh, hi. And five weeks go by. Oh, totally. Whoa. Sorry, let's restart this. Uh, leftover resources. At least you know this is real. <laughs> it's not a recording. <laughs> Do -do -do. I think you have to enter. What's that? Yeah, that's still, oh, never mind. It's waiting for something to be deleted. Those darn CRDs, hey? Who has there problem deleting them? Raise your hand. Come on. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. All right. Nice. I think we're good. Yeah. All right, I'm back. <laughs> the developer. All right. So I created this namespace for my workload a long time ago, and then I just disappeared. Five weeks go by, developer moves on to another project, advanced transaction system is long forgotten until our intrepid admin finds it. What is advanced transaction system? I'm the admin. Do we use it? They go on a three-day quest across many departments, only to find the project was scrapped. Never again says the admin as they delete the namespace. All right, so I find this project called Gatekeeper. I install it. Uh, could you move just a little bit? Thank you. And uh, I find a few namespace templates, or sorry, a few constraint templates that I find are interesting for me. If you recall, we have a few policies we wanted to enforce. So we have the, a template that requires only certain repos a template that makes sure that you have container limits specified, a template for requiring labels, and a template that ensures that you're using a unique label selector for your service. All right, so I'm going to apply these templates, load them into the system, and uh, then I develop my own constraints. I have one constraint for each template here. Uh, again, limiting resources, making sure the owner label is provided, making sure that if I'm using some sort of pod in the prod namespace, its uh, repo needs to be open policy agent. And finally, making sure that my service selectors are unique. Uh, if I look inside of one of these, you can see it's just that same uh, required label constraint that we were showing you before. 
So I'm just going to apply all of these constraints and hand it off to the developer. Wow, I get access to do stuff now? Great. Yes. So let me see if this actually works, though. OK, deploying some stuff to production namespace. Whoa, looks like I'm not allowed to. Why? Because I'm missing the owner label on this namespace. So let me go and add that. Let's see if that actually worked. Great. So next, let me deploy my application. OK, looks like I'm missing the resource limits, like any good developer does. <laughs> well, of course, I'm asking too much. So let me go um, update that resource limit. OK, and it looks like the image I'm, make, I'm using is not for production. So let me go update that as well. I'm just really bad at this. <laughs> no, All you're right. new. You don't know the I'm policy. New. I'm new, yes. Whoa, that actually worked. Wow, that would have taken, I don't know, maybe days to do had I had it not been able to um, just tell me all the issues that I had that I can simply fix myself. That's great. Yeah, she hasn't even talked to me. <laughs> so next, I'm going to actually deploy the service that I need to um, deploy and then give to the front-end developer. And yep, looks like I'm using a bad selector because now I'm pointing to the production instance. That's not good. Bad developer. And there we go. All right. After some more trial and error, the developer service is up and running. All is well with the world until the big outage. The bank is down for hours. All right. Well, we had no idea there were resources in the cluster without resource limits. And they're causing issues in production. We need to get all the resources in the cluster that lack resource limits so we can find this and we can fix it. Um, maybe we could check out the audit results of the container limits constraint. All right, so let's get those. So are you looking at the constraint? I am indeed looking at the wow, constraint. Wow, that's a lot of bad Deployment right there. How did you allow that to happen? Um, Fred did it. Okay, fine. Yeah. Bad Fred. Yeah. It's a blameless culture. <laughs> All right, cool. So, but we can see here we got the audit timestamp, and okay. Well, at least I know the pods we need to fix. Mm -hmm. That'll save a lot of time. That is awesome. All right. The end. Yay. Oh, probably leave that up just in case we need the resources. So that was our attempt to show this thing as something that your organizations can use. Both the admin and the developers can be really happy. So yeah, so the Gatekeeper project is currently at, in alpha state, and we are going to cut a beta release coming end of June. We will love for you guys to try it out and let us know if there are any issues, but most importantly, if there's any feedback that you have around the user experience and maybe also the use cases that we haven't thought of. So please come and join us and, and file some issues. Yes, and uh, as far as where we're looking to take this, uh, there's definitely a lot we could do with it. And one of the biggest use cases we're looking to satisfy is mutation. Also, external data, so think for that owner example, it'd be nice if you could sync your company's LDAP server in so you're actually validating against your company's actual registry rather than some regex. Uh, authorization, like the Kubernetes authorization webhook could be interesting. Uh, it would likely share a lot of the same code base but would live in a different repo because authorization should not run on Kubernetes directly. Uh, definitely more audit features. So right now, audit is good as a debugging tool. We would like to have it be more of a source of truth record, maybe written to a signed Historical log. Historical thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
uh, metrics, super helpful, right? We would like to be able to instrument this thing in Prometheus so you could do things like alerting off of excessive rejections, that kind of thing. And last but not least, developer tooling, so that it makes it easier for people to write constraints, test constraints, or constraint templates, rather, and share them with the world. All right. Uh, well, we'd like to thank a lot of people here, uh, particularly the open policy agent community, because without OPA, we would not have a product. And uh, definitely replicated for don donating the gatekeeper name. And Tim and Torin from Styra for hosting the project, helping guide it, and helping with this presentation. And being uh, Rego experts. Oh, for sure. <laughs> So yeah, please join us, and we, um, you know, you can join the project uh, uh, and look at the the projects on GitHub, um, but also we we hang out uh, on Slack uh, in the Open Policy Agent Slack under Kubernetes Policy, and we also have weekly meetings um, on Tuesday, 2 p.m. Pacific time zone. We're open to changing that <laughs> if the people from Europe are wanting to attend on a regular basis. Please let us know. So oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. So. Oh yes, thank you. Uh, so the question was, do you need to be a Rego expert enabled in order to use Gatekeeper? Uh, I would say that would depend on your usage. Our goal for administration is no. Uh, we would like for the most common use cases to already have constraint templates that people can pick and choose from. And then it's just a matter of loading those into the API server and then putting the parameters into the constraint that match your use case. Uh, if you're looking at writing your own constraints, our goal was to simplify the process somewhat. Uh, you no longer have to worry about all the semantics around what the API server is doing in terms of like how it makes its request uh, for validation or the type of response it's expecting. You only have to worry about validating your object. And you get things like uh, the limitation of scope based off of uh, there's label selector, uh, you can limit on namespace and group version kind. That kind of stuff you get for free because it's provided by the system. Yeah, and um, also post KubeCon, I think we want to um, work on this idea for a policy library such that the community can come together and contribute some of the most commonly used uh, constraint templates. And then after that, you just basically use it and parameterize it however you want in your organization. And we will also try to see if we can add a test mechanism so that you, we have a way to t you, you have a way to test um, Regos if you, if, if you write your own. without blocking anyone from deploying until they start. So the question was, um, if you have an organization with a lot of users, what's the best way to deploy Gatekeeper uh, and all these wonderful policies without impacting end users, correct? Yes. Uh, OK, so uh, my follow-up question would be, so you, you install the system, and you just, you're not sure yet if your policies are right, and you want to test them out? Is uh, that the? No, I think they are right. Oh, I see, I see. So, so essentially you want to use policies to audit and make, sh and, and sort of bring everything to a good state before you start enforcing. So, so one of the um, features that we want to work on uh, for PostQCon is this concept called dry run, which essentially allows the admin to kind of see the impact of a policy before it's applied on the cluster, because we had, um, issues running at ourselves where, as you can see, right when you apply the policy, chances are you already have things in the cluster that are bad, right, bad. 
Um, so what ends up happening is you might not be able to update things that's already in the cluster, right? So we, dry run will hopefully prevent you from, uh, from that from, from happening so that you can proactively fix those things prior to applying the, the policy. Um, and back to the question about how do you ensure that it doesn't block users. Um, I think maybe one way is to roll out like simpler policies first so that they can get the hang of it without like stepping on their toes or whatever. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. I hope Thank that you. answered any other questions? Uh, apart from just dry run, having like only auditing mode, because it doesn't not force the policies, just like lock violations and you can track it with an RF system or something. So yeah, you're suggesting an audit I only mode? Policy agent, but in a soft mode. So only reports, but not enforces the application of policies. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, so, so the, the question was, uh, could we have not only a dry run, but kind of a reporting mode where instead of rejecting, it's, it's more just like taking note, this should have been rejected, uh, that should have been rejected. So you can sort of look and revisit later. Be like a month in this uh, soft mode, and then when everything is resolved and the users are like, use it to apply this policy, you can like report. Yeah, so I think one way um, like current users actually do this today is you can actually uh, skip certain namespace, for example, right? And then in, in those cases, like you can still see how, uh, well, I guess with the dry run, uh, we'll, we're back to that again, is you can see the impact on it without enforcing, I guess. But in order to see them in your logs, it would have to be enforced, at least right now. Yeah, I think some of this might be Prometheus metrics would be interesting here, uh, and definitely the the like right to yeah. log. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, and I think one of the things we we asked about was how how do we write these logs to the Kubernetes auto log? Uh, the answer is currently it's not there. <laughs> um, so we're working with uh, folks in that uh, community to see if we can get that done. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. So the question is: Is it possible to put code into the policies so that you can create arbitrary checks because it's we can't predict everything anyone might ever want to do. Uh, yeah, so uh, part of the answer to that is constraint templates. Uh, in, in fact, that's the majority of the answer to that, is uh, you can put arbitrary rego into constraint templates. It's, um, it's pretty much the full subset. There are some limitations on, uh, like for instance, you can't use imports in constraint templates right now, uh, but that shouldn't, limit what you can actually do with the language. Um, and then I think it could be interesting to have for parameters, being able to put code into the parameters themselves. But I don't know exactly what that might look like uh, in terms of like safety. So um, you, you probably wind up needing to write your own constraint template for the near future. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. You can do that today. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is that team time? Oh, yeah. The question was, can we validate against other resources? And yes. And that's time. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. <laughs>